So, uh, yeah. So, hi all. Uh, I'm Oritro. I am a PhD student at PIFR, and I will be talking about the secondary polarization of the cosmic microwave background from the reionization and post reionization errors. So, uh, during the time of reionization, there are lots of free electrons, which has a peculiar velocity. So, if you go to the electron rest frame, you will see that the CMB is not isotropic, but there are multiples of all orders present. So this is primarily because of the nonlinear nature of the Doppler shift when you go from your frame to the electron rest frame, and also because of the nonlinear relation between the temperature and intensity in the Planck spectrum. But we are only interested in the quadrupolar anisotropy, which is shown by this figure here. So you can see that these, pho that these photons coming to this electron are hotter and these are colder. Uh, I mean, the reverse, sorry, these are colder, these are hotter. And uh, Thomson scattering of these photons with these electrons would create polarized uh, light, even if the initial radiation was unpolarized. So what we can show that the scattered spectrum has not only a black body spectrum, but it also has a white type distortion in it. So you can see in this equation that the quadrupolar part of the relative intensity has a white type spectrum in it. And the amplitude is given by the square of the velocity of the electrons. And this end cap is the direction of the incoming photons. So these are, this was first predicted by Sunel Zaldovich in the 1980s. And these are the few previous works related to this. So, this polarization field is a spin two field. It is characterized by two Stokes parameters, U and Q. And the, it is given by the field uh, is given by this equation from which you can see that it is uh, proportional to the electron number density. And it is proportional to the square of the transverse velocity of the electrons. So for imagine that our line of sight direction is the Z cap direction. And so this X, Y is the plane of the sky. And on this, this is the transverse velocity of, of, of the electrons. And what you can show is that the polarization direction will always be perpendicular to this direction. So this is a, a plot of the power spectrum of this polarization signal. So here in red, you can see the E modes. And, it's, and on blue, is, you can see the B modes for a symmetric homogeneous model of reionization given by some central redshift of 8.5, and the width is characterized by this beta parameter. And uh, so we get both E and B modes from this because it is square in, uh, in the velocity field. And so you get both these E and B modes. And for reference, I have also plotted the pico and prism sensitivity curve uh, to gauge uh, uh, the amplitude of the power spectrum. So these are a few key points. Uh, wh what we have found is that this uh, power spectrum is sensitive to the reionization history, and in particular, how fast the reionization happens. As I already have said that it has a Y-type distortion, and because of which it's, it's, it, it, it can be differentiated from the other primary signals, such as the, the CMB uh, primordial B mode signals, which have a black body spectrum and also other white type distorted signals such as the thermal SZ effect, because this is, the, this is polarized. This is in a way a very clean signal. And if in future their uh, instruments reach uh, good enough sensitivity, you can in possible detect it. So uh, this is a plot showing how the power spectrum varies with respect to the width of the reionization. And on the right, you can see how it varies with the central redshift of reionization. So as you slow down reionization or you increase the width, what happens is that it is a line of sight integrated effect. So the polarization along your line of sight tends to cancel each other and you get a smaller amplitude of the power spectrum. Uh, and the reverse happens if you uh, make the reionization faster. So there is only one go at which all the reionization, all the polarization is produced and that comes to you and which increases the power spectrum. Uh, increasing the cent central redshift of reionization and pushing it to uh, further uh, in, in redshift, what happens is your universe was smaller at that time and the electron number density was higher, which increases the optical depth of the signal. And so your power spectrum overall increases. 
So next we wanted to do is that initially we considered a homogeneous model of reionization. We wanted to do something more realistic. So we wanted to introduce uh, some patchy model of reionization. And also we wanted to consider real density fields, which are not Gaussian distributed. So we moved to simulations and using this 21 centimeter fast, we, um, uh, and heel peaks, we made these sky maps. So on the left, you can see the Q Stokes parameter for the non-patchy case. And on the right, you can see the same for the patch case. If you notice carefully, you will see that this picture is more grainier and probably also notice that this is, has an overall uh, contrast, which is higher than this picture. So this is clear from, if you plot the summary statistics of, of the polarization uh, signal. So in this dotted points, we have dotted is the, our analytic prediction for a homogeneous model of reionization. And you can see that uh, from simulation, we did the same thing and it, it matches pretty well within the cosmic variance error. So then we tried to simulate a patchy reionization model and uh, correspondingly found out its power spectrum. And what you can see is that at small scales, the power is considerably higher, which is evident because you see that this picture is more granular. So it introduces small scale anisotropies. And overall the power, the amplitude is also high with respect to a, a homogeneous model. So next we wanted to uh, see what else we can do in order to make this signal detectable in the coming generation telescopes. So then we came up with this idea of pairwise polarized KZ effect. So the idea is basically that if, so now we are looking at galaxy clusters in, instead of reionization models. So the idea is that if the two galaxy clusters are close to each other, on average, their velocities will be directed towards each other. So for example, let's say our line of sight direction is the Z direction, and this is the plane of the sky. And if the two clusters are uh, close to each other and their velocities are directed towards each other, uh, so there will be always be a component uh, of the transverse velocity, which is uh, directed towards each other. And so if you average over many, many clusters, uh, so if you sum over the two polarization signal, which is always perpendicular to the transverse velocity direction, and if you average over many, many such clusters, you on, then you will get a net non-zero polarization signal. So, and, uh, so this polarization, hello, yeah. So this polarization signal uh, will be, uh, it, it will be dependent on the growth factor, the Hubble parameter, and also the linear power spectrum. And what we have done is that we have calculated the amplitude of the signal as a function of the inter-separation distance between the galaxy clusters. So we have some preliminary results of this. So as I said that you can add the Stokes parameters at one cluster uh, with the other and do an ensemble average with them. And then you get this complicated looking formula. But I want to note you on these highlighted points that the cosmological parameters enters through the growth factor, the growth rate, and the scale factor. These are the uh, linear matter power spectrum dependence. So there is a two, uh, there's a uh, the square of the linear power spectrum in some way, because we had to go to nonlinear density fields because the linear order term was, uh, there wasn't any contribution from the linear order terms. And uh, this red highlighted things denotes that it depends only on two vectors. One is the line, uh, our line of sight vector which we have considered as N12 and the vector which separates the two clusters. And it is like the transverse projection of that vector uh, along, in, the, in the plane of the sky uh, in, on which the signal depends. So you, you can see that the overall signal is at the, at the order of angstrom, but then we can stack many, many such cluster pairs uh, so that our signal to noise ratio increases and on the right, what we have shown is that for a sensitivity of one micro Kelvin arc minute, if I stack around 100,000 cluster pairs, the signal to noise ratio uh, increases over one for certain intercluster separation distance. So in a way, this is good that we can, there's a possibility of detecting this polarization signal uh, in CMBS4. So now I will just add the concluding remarks. I have shown that the polarized signal uh, has a white type distortion. And this signal, it's important to note that it is, it is in the standard cosmological model. The signal is out there. 
It's just that there is no sensitive instrument to detect it. And what we have shown is that it is sensitive to the uh, parameters of reionization, especially to the width of the reionization, even if the total optical depth remains uh, same. It is free from the cosmic variance of the primary polarization signal because it is distinguishable from the other signals because it is a, probably the only signal which is polarized and also has a wide type distortion. And it can act as a foreground uh, for the primordial B modes, but at a tensor to scalar ratio, which is around 3 into 3 to the minus 5 for multipoles which are greater than uh, 100. And lastly, that the pairwise polarization effect has a really a good potential to get observed with CMBS4. And after that, then we can do a lot of cosmology with it. And now we are thinking about that. So with that, I'll end. Uh, thank you. For the talk. Questions? I think, so um, you had said 10 to the five cluster pairs, yes. but that's pairs of 10 to the five clusters, right? Not 10 to the five. So if we can select 10 to the power, of, uh, 10 to the five cluster pairs from the upcoming service, this is the prediction for that. So I only need a thousand clusters and then I need to do- no, you, you, need, you, you need pairs? more than 10 to the power five clusters in order to get 10 to the power five cluster pairs because there will be some clusters which will be correlated. I mean, if we choose two clusters, then we cannot choose this cluster with another cluster at the same distance because it will be correlated and you have to, the noise will be correlated in that case. You cannot just add up noise like that, but I can use the same cluster with another cluster, which is at a different distance. Mm -hmm. So in that way, we can use, reuse one more, uh, that cluster in, uh, one more time. So it's, so I haven't got any data saying that how many cluster pairs independently you can find out at, as a function of inter-separation distance. So it is just a prediction just like that. But if I get a real data on how many cluster pairs I can find at, in, at, as, as a function of inter-separation distance, then we can precisely calculate. So this I have assumed that we can find uh, 10 to the power five cluster pairs at each inter-cluster separation distance. Okay, but that's not based on, so that's an-, an It's a prediction from us. It's not based on real data that is out there. Okay, so, but you could go into simulations and figure out- how Yes, yes, the next, yeah. So the next uh, obvious step is to go to simulation as, and to really find it out. Okay. In simulations. Great, thank you. So at second order, there's also a bias that comes from yes. the shear field. Yes. Because oh, okay. this one is B2. Yeah. I, and so is there okay. any chance of seeing that? Yeah, I have to think about that. I haven't think, but yeah, I would love to hear that idea. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Aditya, for the talk. Thank you.